Better hurry. Get a seat. Yeah. 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 We're going to be getting started here. against Austria-Hungary having power over Serbia. And it all started with when Serbia, when that fellow assassinated Archduke, they did not make a move on Serbia yet because they wanted Germany to have their back. Now, Germany didn't actually start any uh, military action to almost three or four weeks after that. Then once they did, uh, there was an alliance with Russia and Serbia, so Russia went on the Serbian side, and then when Germany attacked Belgium, they, there was an alliance between England and Belgium, and they got into the war along with France. So that's how, how all that started. There was a bunch of alliances that, that they had to back each other up. So that was, that was like the start of what really uh, ended up beginning World War I. And it was a, a chain reaction, sort of. But anyway, we go down, we go to May 15th. They had the, the Germans had submarines. They were about 210 feet long. They had around 30 people as a crew. They only carried around four, four to six torpedoes. They had an exhaust sticking out of the water. So when they, when they went under when they went under water a little, they, they lowered that stack. They run on batteries. Now they were only going like about three or four knots. I mean, it wasn't some spectacular speed. And uh, so they were really in the beginning of submarine warfare. So they had unrestricted submarine warfare. So they were sinking anything and everything that came across into the English Channel into England because they wanted to cut off England's supply route. Well, unfortunately, the Lusitania, which was a very fast passenger ship, 30 knots, but when it hit Southern Ireland, 
It ran into a fog bank. It slowed down, and a, and a U-boat swam two torpedoes into it, sinking it, killing 112 Americans. Now, Wilson was really upset over that, so they, he had communications with the uh, Imperial German uh, leadership, and he, they, he was really adamant about it, and they slowed it down. They stopped the unrestricted warfare on commercial vessels. So on the 1st of uh, February, there's the Lusitania. And by the way, Wilson actually, here's the thing, Wilson actually were telling the people not to go on the ship. I mean, he, he was adamant about it, but he couldn't stop them, but they went anyway. Now, next slide. Okay. After February 1st, Zimmerman got in touch with General Ludendorff and von Hindenburg and said, we need to start sinking all these merchant ships coming into England. We've got to cut them off, starve them out. So they started unrestricted submarine warfare again. On the 3rd, the United States broke off all military ties. February 24th, U.S. received this telegram, the Zimmerman telegram. And a lot of people don't know about this particular aspect of it. But at Germany, Zimmerman actually wrote a telegram to Mexico, which was intercepted by British intelligence, who then fed it to Wilson and his staff. And the telegram said, Mexico, we would like you to attack the United States from the south. Because if they figured if the United States would stay out of the war, then they could win it. And in return, if the German, the, the Central Powers actually won the First World War, they would give Mexico back Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico, and some other property as well. Well, when Wilson found this out, this was what put the nail on the coffin, because what did Wilson, what did, what did Wilson run on? He ran on the fact that God going to keep you out of the war. And that's what got him elected in, in, in 16, in 1916. That's what got him elected. I'll keep you out of the war. Well, anyway, he couldn't even, he could not at this time say, no, we, we, I, I'll keep you out of the war. You have to get into it. So, on April 4th, the Congress actually gave Wilson the approval to declare war on the Central Powers. On the 6th, that's when he announced it to the, the, the populace of the United States. On the 6th, that we were going to declare war on the Imperial German and Central Powers. Excuse me, Mexico. That's Wilson right there in the next one. And this is Wilson in Congress. The next one, please. That's Wilson in Congress on the, on the 4th and the 6th, declaring that he was going to declare war on the Central Powers. Go to the next frame, please. Well, the build-up. Here's the build-up. <laughs> we only had 200,000 people in our army at that time, 200,000 men. And most of those men were National Guardsmen and reservists. We only had about two divisions that were worthy of a battle that actually knew how to shoot a gun. Because a lot of these, a lot of these guys in the reserves and in the National Guard didn't even happen to know how to shoot a gun. So there was a buildup. But before that, General Pershing, they said if there was ever going to be a six-star general, it would be him. He was an unbelievable man. He, gra he uh, was born in Laclede, Missouri in 1860, graduated from West Point in 1886, and went on to be one of the most notable generals in the United States Army. And his nickname was Black Jack Pershing. The reason why I got his nickname 
When he graduated from West Point as a second lieutenant, he was in charge of the 10th Cavalry Regiment. That regiment was an all-black regiment. Hess, Black Jack Pershing. But the newspapers back then were not as polite as that. So anyway, old Black Jack Pershing, and he, uh, Pershing really distinguished themselves fighting the Moros over there in the Philippines. And that, and our officers were using 38s over there, and they were dropping those guys. And that's when we started the Colt 45. And there was three companies that, that actually vowed for that contract. And what they did was they, I think it was Ruger, Colt, and I, I don't know whether it was Brett or not. I, 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 the third one, I, it skips my mind. But anyway, they would shoot 100 rounds, let it cool, 100 rounds, let it cool to 1,000. Then clean the weapon and do it again. And the cool won out. Every, the other guns were starting to fail. So that's how we got the 1911, Colt 1911. But anyway, since we, owned, we had a great strong navy, Kremlin 6, we had about 300 ships. We had a very strong navy. May 17th, uh, the Selective Service Act. So we had to instill the Selective Service Act. May of 17th, we, act, we started the Selective Service Act, men from 21 to 30. Unfortunately, we were not getting enough men signing up. So what happened? In August of 17, we, uh, raised the, we changed the, the ages of the men from 18 to 40. Before we knew it, we had over 24 million men signed up for the draft. Now, you have to figure, this is 100 years ago. Our population was not that great. So that 24 million men, that was probably one-fifth of our population at that time. So anyway, we started, and we, the jerk, France and England were so excited that we entered the war, they thought we were just going to bring men over there and men over there, until Pershing went over there and met with Hagen in, in England. Boy, they had all kind of people there at the train and the cheering them and everything. He came off the train with 2,000 men. They said, where's your army? He said, well, it's going to take a while for us to, to put this army together. We didn't even have enough forts or posts, even to train these men. Matter of fact, the 77th Division out of New York went to Camp Upton. They, they actually built Camp Upton, trained in Camp Upton, and then they went overseas. So you can see we didn't even have enough of forts to even train our men. Well, anyway, uh, General Pershing gets it all together. He comes back. He said, you know what? We're not going to be ready to it for another year at least. And uh, they were really disappointed. So, they, so the French and the English came up with this idea. Don't worry about it. Bring your men over here. We'll train them for you. Well, Wilson and, and Pershing said no. We're going to fight under our own flag. We are not going to be embedded in your army, which was a very smart move. And it turned out it was a very smart move because Wilson sat at the head of the table at the Treaty of Versailles. He's the one that actually called the shots. Well, anyway, so Pershing went over there, and uh, they started to uh, train these men, and really, if you think about it, we were only over there from uh, maybe six months total, full force. We were sending over a quarter million men a month. And the Germans just not could keep up with that because of those men in the German army were so war wary. I mean, they've been fighting for four years in trenches. There were so many trenches that they said you can walk from Switzerland to the English Channel and not go above ground. 400 and something miles of trenches. And it's just not one trench. The way the trench system was set up, you had a forward trench, you had a support trench, and then you had a rear area. The guys in the front would be there maybe three or four weeks. They would move to the rest area. The support guys would go up to the front. And then the rest of the men would go to the support, and they would rotate these men around. Because it was just too much for them to be in this mud and disease and so on in these trenches.
So they gave everybody a fair shot at it. Now, and in between the two trenches were communication trenches. And under the trenches were a straight line, naturally, because you, you don't want a straight line in the trench, because you can shoot people 100, 200 yards down the, down the trench, and there's nowhere for these men to run. So they zigzagged the trenches. That's why you see the zigzag. OK, next slide. OK, the 42nd Division, which is still active today, they were probably the first division to actually make it over to France, and it was 1917. But they really didn't see much action then. And a lot of these guys went over there um, with our own, we, the rifles that we actually had at that time, we had the 03 Springfield, which was not widely used. We only made about six to 800,000 of them. We had the 1917, the model 1917, who we actually were making those for the British to house a 303 shell. We then, once we had a war, retold our factories to a 30 odd six. And everybody goes, what's the odd six mean? The odd six means it's the date that the shell was made. The date, not some significant of the, the shell itself. Because shells are measured in millimeter, like uh, 6.72 6 by 53. So that's how they're made. But this was odd six. Well, anyway, the 42nd went over there, and they were using 1917. 75% of our men were actually using uh, 19, model 1917s. Even the great Sergeant York used that particular model. So the 42nd, and what they did was, after that, if you look at the 42nd patch today, division, it's half there. You don't see the full rainbow because they have respect for the men they left over there in World War I. That's what they did. Now, MacArthur was a major at this time, and this division was made up of National Guardsmen from 26 states and Washington, D.C. So, <laughs> MacArthur said, you know, to his superior, this Division stretches across the United States like a rainbow, and that's stuck. The Rainbow Division. It is still active today, like I said. And they, and they really distinguished themselves at St. Miguel Offensive and the Muse Argonne Offensive. They, they had approximately 14,000 casualties in their division, and around 3,000 of them were KIA. Now you have to understand when you got when you got when you were in in no man's land and you got hit, there was no helicopter coming in and taking them out, and there was no no medic out there helping you. You just you ended up dying. You just bled out. So anyway, that's the 42nd, and I'll I'll talk about that a little later. Then we got the 77th Division, the New Yorkers from Camp Upton. They had over 60-some days in active sectors. In other words, they saw 60-some days of combat. And they went over there in 1918. So you have to figure, they saw a lot of action. And the only two other divisions that surpassed the 77 in action was the 1st Division and the 3rd Division. The 1st Division had 20,000 casualties. The 3rd Division had close to 16,000 casualties. So you can see uh, the, the 1st and 3rd Division really saw a lot of action. Then it came to the 77th Division. But you know, the, the thing about the 77th Division is that it, uh, in the Muse Argonne Offensive, it, when they went over the top, they, they were really, uh, they distinguished themselves quite well. But the Muse Argonne Offensive, the 77th and the 42nd, really distinguished themselves. And on the north end of the, the north end of the offensive, Patton and his tanks. And here's, a, here's how he, Patton actually got to be a tank commander. They were looking for tanks, and he said, I'll be a tank commander. He said, I was the first guy that actually had a weapon on a moving vehicle. Because during the Mexican War, 
He was on the back of a pickup truck with a machine gun. As the truck went down, he's shooting at these men on horses in front of him. So he said, I'm the only man that has experience in anything like that. So that's how he ended up with the job. But Patton really distinguished himself. I mean, he got shot in the leg of the Musargon offense, and he kept directing his tanks. He was right on his tank. He didn't was it in the tank. He was on the tank directing them. And uh, he was using Renault tanks at that time. They actually had a turret. It was a pretty revolutionized tank. And it was later on in the war. And I'll, I'll go over the tanks a little later. But anyway, next slide, please. Here we go. I'm going to talk about these battles here. The Battle of Battle of Wood. The 56 Marine Regiments, they distinguished themselves so much there that the Germans were so afraid of them, they ended up calling them the Devil Dogs. And that's how they got their name. Now you have to imagine, the woods are over there, and, and the Germans are in there with their Maxim 1908 machine guns, just firing away, and here comes these Marines that had a cross about 300 yards of wheat field. Nowhere to hide. They were just getting cut down. The first day they lost 1,000 men. So they dig, they go so far they start to dig in, and, and it was a joke after a while. The guys were saying, Yeah, we're digging our graves as they're digging their foxholes. The battle was so fierce, it lasted 29 days. So fierce, hand to hand combat, beating each other with the butts of their rifles, stabbing them any way they can to stay alive. The Marines prevailed. And the greatest thing about that is when, as the Marines were going in to battle Bella Wood, here comes the French retreating. And he tells the, he tells the, he tells the I think it was a captain, you guys better not go up here. You know, and then the captain goes, retreat, hell, we just got here. And the one captain, one sergeant told his men, let's go, man. We don't want to live. You don't want to live forever. And away they went. I mean, these guys were these guys were tough guys. And not only that, they were marksmen. A lot of these guys were such marksmen with their rifles. I mean, they were picking them off left and right. The Germans couldn't believe it. They thought they had them whooped, and the breed just kept coming. So Bellawood was one of the most fiercest battles. In, uh, in World War I, and the 56th Regiment Marines, I'll tell you what, they really earned their name, the Devil Dogs, that particular offensive. And then September, the, the Musargon Offensive, we lost 52,000 men in World War I in a short period of time. Can you imagine if we were over there for four years? We had lost three, four, five hundred thousand men. We lost 52,000 men. On the Musargon Offensive, we lost half of those men in that offensive. 26,000 men died during the New Sargon offensive. We had 1.2 million men in that battle, the United States soldiers, 1.2 million. We had about 2,700 artillery pieces. I mean, we bombarded them, we thought we were okay. I mean, those Germans were so embedded and then we come to the Lost Battalion. General Alexander tells Willisey, and that's the fellow on the right there, Major Willisey on the right. There's old Sergeant York on the left. That's where he, he got his Medal of Honor at the New Sargon Offensive. But we know about uh, old York. He, uh, <laughs> he captured, him and his, a few of his men captured 128 men took care of about, I don't know, four or five machine gun nests that were pinning them down. And he comes marching out with a couple men and 121, 28 Germans. And, they, and his commander, I mean, his, his officer, the commanding officer, who, who, who helped you here? Don't have them. We did it ourselves, you know? So anyway, he ended up with the uh, Medal of Honor. And um, I had the, my wife and I had the privilege of uh, being at his house in Palm Wall, Tennessee. His great niece was the, was the uh, curator there, and we walked through his house, and that was the same house that was in the movie, Sergeant York. Well, anyway, the next fella, like I said, Willisey, he, uh, he pushed
pushed ahead so far, and Alexander keeps telling him, the French, is, uh, the French got your left flank, the United States got your right flank, just keep going, you're fine. Well, he pushed so far ahead of the rest of them because the flanks weren't moving at all. He pushed far, so far ahead that the Germans actually surrounded him October 2nd. They ran out of water, food, running out of ammunition. They had no bandages for the wounded. It was just horrible. And on top of that, they had an artillery barrage from the American the United States that were hitting them, killing their own men. And they still stayed there. And the German people, the German officers were begging him to surrender, and he wouldn't do it. He just wouldn't do it. So old Willsey went in there with over 500 men, walked out with 197. The siege lasted from October 2nd to October 8th. The morning of October 8th, finally, the, the army caught up to him and, and saved the rest of the guys. And the war naturally was over the following month. So, but here's the kicker about, he was a New York lawyer, by the way, corporate lawyer. In 1921, he gets aboard, well, 1919, they actually made a movie, The Lost Battalion, and he played it. But this ate on his mind of all the men he lost, because he could have surrendered and saved a lot, or, or retreated, but he never did. He, uh, boarded a ship in New York bound for Cuba. Sitting at the captain's table, having a great evening. His, the captain says his demeanor was upbeat and happy and all this. Well, he leaves the table and they never saw him again. He went over the top and went into the ocean and killed himself. He just couldn't live with what, what happened over there. And he was a Medal of Honor winner, by the way. And that is the Lost Battalion. If you ever get a chance to, Ricky Schroeder plays Captain Wilsey in that particular. It's a great movie. You see it sometimes on the History Channel. And I got to tell you about Sergeant York, the movie Sergeant York. It is it is pretty hilarious because Sergeant York actually used a, he, he had six Germans coming at him, and he shot all six of them with his 45. Okay, in 1911. Well, in the movie. It depicts, he's using the wrong rifle, he's using an 03 Springfield. And then he uses a German Luger. And I looked at that movie, I said, that's wrong. Well, I looked it up. During the movie, he couldn't handle the 45, the recoil was too much for me. So they hit the game of a whole nine millimeter Luger. And I thought that was hilarious because that was not what he used. Okay? But that was just one of the things that, you know, when you, when you, when you're around all this all the time and you know what they use, then you see a movie and say, they never used that or they never did that. So you can pick it up pretty good. Next thing. Okay, this is it right here. Now this is the 11th hour, 11th day, 11th month. That will live with us for such a long time. And it was always Armistice Day. And my sister, I always was jealous of her because her birthday was on Armistice Day and she always got off in school. I said, you have your birthday, you get off on your birthday every year, and I was a little jealous as a brother. But anyway, 11, 11, 11. Next thing, please. Okay, let's have a little test here. Who do you think this is right here? First guy. Who is it? Marshall, that is correct. What school did he go to? BMI. BMI, yep. Next guy over. Top guy, middle. Middle on top. Harry Truman. He was a captain. He was of an artillery battery. That was pretty easy on the other side. Churchill. Down below Churchill. No. Oh, no. Next one. Oh, with the cigar in his hand. MacArthur. MacArthur, yep. That is MacArthur. And then over here with the tank? The middle. Hitler. You see that mustache he has there? 
How do you think he got his mustache? Got a bottle brush. Go ahead. He, uh, he, there was a gas attack, and when he, and then the gas attack, he was unable to put on his gas mask. It wouldn't seal. And look, well, not really luckily, but luckily for him, yeah. he survived it, and he cut it off. So he just cut it and he gave him his bottle brush mustache. That's how he has his mustache today, and that's why he has it, because of the gas attack. Very good, Sean. Anyway, uh, old Hitler. And here's the surprising, if you ever watch the military channel, they always show that one part. Hitler's down in the mud, and he gets up, and there's this British soldier, 50 yards away, sees Hitler, and he doesn't shoot. Because Hitler did not have a weapon. And Hitler got his iron cross not of being brave, he was just a runner. He just ran I mean, from one post, one observation to the other, to the other, to the other. That, that's how, it, and I think it was the second class iron cross, it wasn't the first class. But anyway, he wore it proudly his whole time, you know, at, uh, even in World War II. Next. Okay, let's talk about tanks. First modern war. Airplanes, tanks, submarines, rapid fire artillery, machine guns, weapons of mass destruction. They say for every four years of war, we gain 20 years of technology. 20 years. And think about it in 1918, our planes are only going about 130 miles, 113, 114 miles an hour. 51 years later, we landed on the moon. Now that is amazing. So, the Mark I tank. Well, the Mark I tank, the tanks were introduced September 15, 1916, in the Battle of the Somme. There were 40 tanks lined up, and they didn't realize it because when in England, when they actually uh, used these tanks to train with them, it was all flat land, beautiful. Well, at the Battle of the Somme, there were Artillery craters everywhere. So these tanks, 40 of them took off, 38 of them broke down before they even got maybe 50, 60 yards. Two of them made a little, went a little further, and that was it. Mark I tanks. At the Battle of Cambria, a, few, a year later in Cambria, which was flat terrain, they came out with the Mark IV tank. Now, inside these tanks, eight men, a 57 millimeter cannon out the front, Hoskins machine, machine guns out the side, 125 degrees inside. The, the engine stood right in the middle of the tank. The screen you see on top is for, they were log grenades that would bounce off that screen. So it wouldn't get, yeah, that's what that screen is. And that wheels on the back were supposed to help them turn and maneuver. The guys hated it. So they eventually they got rid of them. Cambria was the first tank attack that actually was very successful. They had about 400 tanks. They're coming down the field into Cambria. The Germans didn't know what the heck was going on because on the front of these were these gigantic fascines, they called them. A ton and a half of wood across the front of the tank. What they were for was once they got up to the trench, they would drop these fascines into the trench so they could roll across the trench without any problem. And the trench. The Germans, they started running, except for this one unit that were trained in defending against tanks. But they actually did a great job. That was the first time. Then actually the Renault tank, the Germans came up with a tank, but it was a really cumbersome looking tank. These tanks, these tanks only went three and a half miles an hour. The, German, the English came up with the Whippet, a tank called the Whippet. Boy, that went an astounding eight and a half miles an hour. And they had four machine guns out the side, two men inside, so the guy in the middle had to go run shooting all the machine guns, and sometimes a driver would help too. Eventually they put a cannon in there, I think it was a 37 millimeter cannon in there, but that was about it. But they were called whippets. The armor wasn't that much, I mean, 
they, 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 they were easy to build and they put them out there. The first rotating turret was the Renault tank built by the French. We were supposed to build it in the United States, that never happened. So we, we ended up using the French tanks in, the, in, our, uh, in our offensive during the uh, First World War. All right, let's look at the Fokker D7. The Fokker D7 was probably one of the best airplanes that the Germans made. They had over combined over 500 kills. And we all know about the Red Baron. He, his famous tri-wing plane was an RD-1 tri-plane, Fokker RD-1 tri-wing. Tri he was using the Albatross at one time. The Albatross had a major problem with it. A lot of his skills were with the Albatross, but in a steep dive, one time the Red Baron's wing just started, just started ripping away from the plane. He, he did make it home. But anyway, the, the Red Baron, they said that uh, our, it was ground fire that killed him. It wasn't aerial combat, it was ground fire that actually killed him. And then you had the Stat 13. That was the one that actually combated the R the uh, Fokker, D Fokker D7, but the Spath 13, who made this one famous? Was Eddie Rickenbacker, that's right. Eddie Rickenbacker had 26 confirmed kills. He ended up going down in a B-17 in World War II, on the water for 30 days. He wrote a book about the seagull that saved his life. They ate the seagull, and he ended up being one of the owners of Eastern Airlines. He started Eastern Airlines. But the SPAD-13 and the Fokker D-7 were definitely the planes uh, of that time. The, there were so many, then we had the Camel back then. Here's the funny part, everybody thinks that the, remember the British, the Germans went over there, the, the Blitz, uh, the, uh, the, over London, all the Stookers and the Stookers and all that, going over there in the JU-88 bombing the heck out of that. Well, World War I, guess what? The blimps, they had blimps going over there. They were flying 10,000 feet, go over and bomb the crap out of England. And guess what happened? <laughs> Their planes, when they took off, had a circle around to get up to 10,000 feet. By the time they got up to 10,000 feet, the Germans are already gone. But eventually, they, uh, they came up with some different planes. But they actually, uh, the blimps, it was, that wasn't the first time one of them was bombed. World War I, they were bombed, bombed as well. Is there any questions? Yes? Um, the one question I had is, um, when they invented, when the gas masks were invented, what they used to do to actually prevent, like, you know, if they get destroyed by that stuff, is they used to take, like, gas Yes. Exactly. And that would help. But here, but mustard gas, guess what mustard gas did? It got into the soil, so these guys were going on the ground, they were still getting infected because it took about two weeks or so for it to actually dissipate. The, uh, it's a, uh, well, gas was a horrible thing. Matter of fact, the, the fellow that this, the, uh, Wilson, Monroe Wilson, was actually gassed. A, a, a soldier here from Gavar was gassed. On his way home, he died. Am I correct, Frank? Yep. So uh, the, the post is named after him. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, how did the uh, stop with the camel do very well? The camel? Yeah. It was a slow plane, maybe 112 miles an hour. And okay. you know, you think about this. These planes, when they went up for battle, there was no parachutes. <laughs> they had no parachutes. Then when they got shot down, they got shot down. I mean, they went down with the plane. So you could see how brave these men were to do this. But the Camel was just a, it's just a, a British plane that came out, which was very effective, don't get me wrong. But it was not like this. It came out late. The SPAT-13 and the, in the, in the, in the Fokker D-7 were definitely the planes at the time. And, and, the, and the Red Baron never got to fly any uh, the Fokker D-7 because they were already, uh, they were all, uh, the, they were all, he was already dead when that, all that happened. Yes? And 
Have you seen Space Jam on Broadway? Yes. I guess it was calling that way. Well, it, it was down here. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we saw that. But that was probably one of the most, it was pretty gory. Now you have to figure these guys, you know, while all this was going on in 1917, in 1917, the Communist Party started. You got Lenin and Trotsky starting that. The, the Russian soldiers rushed home because they had a they, there was civil war in the country. All this stuff was going on. The Bolshevik Revolution. The, the Spanish flu. You know, we lost 52,000 men KIA, 63,000 men to disease and other causes. And it was the Spanish flu that actually did it. All of our men, some of our men, never even made it out of the camps here in the United States. Then a lot of them got on the transports to go over, and they weren't showing symptoms. But halfway over, they were showing symptoms. So they're affecting all these other guys. Three, 30, 30 million men, people died from the Spanish flu. And here's a little tidbit for you. In 1916, here in the United States, daylight savings time began. And it was for the farmers, by the way. Any other questions? Yes. How did the show our patriotism for these brave soldiers? There, well, there were so many, well, at that time, believe it or not, if you were German in World War I, you were pretty well treated not too good. They were busting their windows out. They were well, chastising them. They hurt, I mean, they were really giving, giving it to them. And the people here in the United States, you know, we had women, they talked about the women of World War II, which was outstanding. Well, we had women in World War I. And guess what? Back then, the dresses hit the floor. If you showed your ankle back then, you were, that was risque. And they all had long hair. Well, when they went into the factories, guess what? The dresses come up, the hair got cut. And that was like the first re women's re revolution. Yes? Partially, they designed shorter dresses to use less material. There you go. Overseas. That's it. And we had sugar rationing and all that other stuff. Yeah. That was something. My father would have been eligible for World War I, but he was a coal miner. And if you were into that kind of job, you could not be drafted. They needed that. Yeah. The, the energy, absolutely. It was for, for the national defense, I guess. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Certificate of appreciation oh, for you, you coming today. We oh, thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, damn it, uh, Cassiano, in recognition and sincere appreciation for your participation in the 100th birthday celebration. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Oh, you said so, please, yes, and we follow.